Yes. <laughs> well, boy, I'll tell you, mine is scribbled all over. <laughs> anyway, so who wants to open? Uh, uh, Elnora was starting to say this book was a little different, and some people maybe had a little trouble. I did hear a couple people say that they had trouble getting into it. So were there people that had trouble with the book? And if so, why? <laughs> Cheryl? Oh, I I, uh, I read about three quarters of it, and uh, it started feeling a little academic. Um, I did a little impersonation for Pam today. I said, and the virus was in China, <laughs> and then the next chapter, and then it was in Alaska, and then it was in Spain, <laughs> and then it was in France, <laughs> and so... Um, <laughs> But there were some interesting parts to it that, you know, like I just picked up one where Gustav Klimt, you know, painted the tragic deaths that uh, he found um, that no miracle could really uh, take this devil away. Um, and so those parts were kind of interesting where they talked about, you know, religious beliefs and um, what different cultures thought the disease was and how much yeah. that resonates today where people yeah. just deny science. That's all. And don't want to wear their masks. <laughs> yeah. And want to gather in big groups. Yeah, in fact, the Josephi Center got a call for a wedding reception for over 85 people. And we quickly said, no. <laughs> so, so Elnora, you, you talked about a little difficulties at the beginning too. So I, I ended up almost by a mistake getting it on audiobook, but in the end, it was actually from my perspective, for me anyway, the best way to listen to such a long book with such a lot of details and um, facts. I, I, at first I thought, Okay, a book about a pandemic, it happened, this many people died, um, this is what people did to try to deal with it, end of story, right? Oh my god, the amount of things she found to put in a book about a pandemic was incredible. Uh, you know, she talked about what was the state of medicine at this time, what, what were the political goings on in every country that either helped or hurt uh, cutting back on the virus. It was like, it was very comprehensive. Uh, I thought it. I thought that detail was a bit overwhelming, but it was easier to take. Uh, you know, listening in, a, you know, half hour, forty-five minute sessions. So I, I think she did a great service because it's. I mean, it's a great reference book. So uh, she clearly did a lot of work on it. I appreciate it. Uh, it wasn't the most compellingly interesting book to me did 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 anybody not realize um how extensive uh the the just the the killing of that disease was no before reading this book no had no idea and had no idea how many countries it affected and and not just once but twice that was like Wow. I, I, the piece I didn't know about it was that it really was the two waves and the first wave because it was yeah. much milder um, caused people to be less concerned when the second wave hit until you know they were already so far into it mm. and so many people were dying that it was tragic. Yeah. yeah. I have had you know people have told me uh Oh yeah, go to any graveyard and look at the 1918 grave markers. Uh, I, th I think the thing that, oh, go ahead, Greg. No, I'm just interesting. Um, yeah, the numbers were surprising to me too. The, I, I'd like to see the comparison to today's percentage wise. I didn't do the math there, but it was quite, quite amazing. Yeah, the, well, death, the death rate per thousand or death rate per hundred um, was maybe double ours, but that's all. It's not 
it was not that much more deadly than what we're dealing with. The body right. was just a lot less. Rich, aren't I getting that right? Yeah, well, I think the thing is, hello, Debbie, welcome. I think the thing is that that, uh, that she makes clear, there are epidemics or pandemics that are um, transmitted easily and not as deadly. And there are others that are transmitted more difficulty like Ebola yeah. and that are deadly. I mean, Ebola kills half the people that contract it, okay? Mm -hmm. And this flu is probably not as, uh, was not as deadly. And then there were, there's the immunity thing. I think that the, the thing that struck me right from the beginning was I took modern European history, I took American history, I took, I, I, I'll tell you what, <laughs> I can remember uh, my modern European history class was an upper division class at the, the final, remember in the days of blue books? Yeah. The professor walked in and wrote on the board across the whole board, why did Europe go to war in 1914 and walked out and said, okay, in the next four hours, fill up your blue books. Huh. But in that whole deal, I don't remember us ever talking about the flu. Yeah. The, I'm... the flu killed more American servicemen than war did. Now, one of the things I saw going back and checking my notes today was, however, in Europe, the flu didn't kill as many as the war did. Right. Okay. In Germany and yes. France. In Germany, France, and even in England. In England, Italy. that's right. That's but it right. More people than both World War One and World War Two combined. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, for me, it's similarly, I really had no um, knowledge of, of this and I started to get interested. I was doing some homeschooling with our nine-year-old and he was coming up, you know, with what did he want to study? And of course he's home because of the virus. So he wants to study the bubonic plague, the black death and the Spanish flu. So great. So we start doing some research and I got interested and then, um, I don't know, Tony, somehow we came across Pale Rider. And I was first interested um, because she wrote it before this coronavirus pandemic. Mm -hmm. She wrote it in 17. Right. Right. And I'm like, well, that's fascinating. And then started to get into the story of it and particularly the parallels with what we're dealing with now and in particular, the social behavior um was most interesting to me i i admit i don't have the copy still at the cabin and i have i also got bogged down about three quarters of the way through but what the last thing i'll say is that then i i picked up david laskin's book um long way home which is also world war one but he's following um recent immigrants from all over Europe who've just come into the country and then are drafted and sent back to Europe right. to fight. And it's, um, there's no, there's no clue references in his book. So Can this somebody mute right. themselves, please? Sub, um, text of this war seems to have been largely ignored. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, oh, go ahead, Nancy. So I am not a big history person and didn't take a lot of history in college and that kind of thing. It was curious to me um, uh, that here it was written in 2017. We all had it. It was a playbook for what we needed to do as this pandemic started to emerge. And the total disregard, ignorance, whatever, to, um, to the realities that were right in front of our faces. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure people at the CDC have read this. Um, yeah. and, and they would have been educated, but I can't believe that none of our political leaders, ob obviously none of our political leaders had read it. 
um, they don't read. You know, our naivete about something that can have such an enormous impact. And then you also think about Gates. Five years ago, six years ago, whenever it was, he started to say, hey, our biggest threat is a pandemic. And everybody's like, la, 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 la. Um, right. And we've right. had, you know, it's how many warnings do we have to have before we take responsible steps to protect people in our country, people around the world. And the sad part is those who are most vulnerable, of course, are the ones who are hardest hit. Right. Debbie, you right. were going to yeah, you know, the my first introduction to the impact of a pandemic was reading Ivan Doig's English Creek trilogy, and I remember the feel of English Creek before the war and the and the flu, and then the feel of it and the population and just the whole impact afterwards just left me chilled and empty, and um, that was pretty much my first awareness of it on that level. Uh, well, well, I had actually read, um, again, I had found, a, a, you know, I, Catherine Ann Porter's Pale Rider, but I didn't, re, I didn't remember. It. And if I read it, I read it in a lit class and not in a history class. And I went back and read Pale Rider. It's an excruciating story of, um, of her, uh, Catherine Ann Porter was smitten. She and her lover, uh, he was getting ready to go overseas. They got the flu in, in Denver where she was working on a newspaper as a journalist. And uh, she gets horribly sick and her descriptions are, are incredible. And then um, she was expected to die and didn't, and he died. And... Uh, it's it's a uh, it's a chilling story. It's really a really a, 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 one of the things. You, to, oh, go ahead, Nancy. And I was going to say my primary um, way of knowing anything about it at all was through literature, and it was things like um, Stegner, and then I recently read a book called Murmur of Bees. That's um, uh, South American author, I think it's Mexican American, it is Mex Mexican author, um, about the impact of that in the communities uh, near Monterey, Mexico. And, you know, so through, but, but I've probably read about it a half dozen times. And each time, I thought like everybody died, because the communities written about, there were huge death tolls. I was surprised it wasn't more deadly. Um, 50 million is a huge number, but when you consider world population, um, you know, it's still in small percentages. I thought the death toll from it was more like 40 or 50%, not two or whatever the percentage was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, well, the, yeah, and the plague, of course, killed like one third of Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, and when smallpox first hit, there was a smallpox epidemic that, uh, well, in, in, in the Americas, they figured that it, it, it killed as many as 75 to 90 percent of the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. uh, between smallpox, the plague, the flu, and a couple of other things. I think one of the things she says that made some sense to me, and she tried to organize the book, I'm thinking about it that way, she said the flu was something that spread rapidly across the globe in this two-year period but it wasn't and the war was four years deep in a confined place so easier to write history about that and especially if the writers of of American and European history were impacted more by the war than they were by the disease. Hey, Rich, does she talk about um, why a lot of us haven't heard much about this? Um, was it kind of a one and done, or what, did the war uh, totally take take over the headlines? Or, well, I think the war did gobble it up. And as she said, a couple of things happened. 
one because it was this this widespread thing and because it was 1918 we didn't have facts and figures and stuff from india and from brazil and from all the other places that it hit so mm -hmm. it kind of dissipated that way and then there was certainly the euphoria with the close of the war people were ready to be you know just go and get themselves ready for a depression um, <laughs> One of the things, I don't think she mentioned it, does she? Or it was in the other book I read. Um, uh, Wilson actually had the flu during the Versailles Treaty, treaty Talks. Did she, did she say this or does she somebody talks, else? She did talk about it. And there are people who attribute some of the kind of mistakes made at the end of World War II one to the fact that he was incapacitated during right. negotiations right. and so many of the initiatives that he was promoting really didn't get represented well and england and france took germany to the cleaners which contributed to world war ii with the high high reparations and all that and also the 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 division of the middle east which gave us the mess that we still have today in the middle east and uh, whether Wilson would have been able to do more about that, it's, it's hard to tell, but I, you know, can't answer. One of the things I found really interesting, and unfortunately for those who only got three quarters of the way through, it was at the end, she talks about some of the longer term impacts of the flu. One of them was the conclusion of World War I and the way it contributed to the buildup toward World War II. But the other were, um, well, one was about a third of the people who had the flu and lived had um, a brain fog and depression that haunted them for anywhere from a year to many, many years um, following it. And it's interesting because we're starting to hear reports of people having, they're calling them long haulers, but they're people who recover technically from COVID, but remain uh, affected by brain fog, depression, um, can't sleep, a number of things. She also commented on how that impacted some of the writers of the 20s, um, Virginia Woolf, I think Thomas Woolf, Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. all of whom had the flu and each were very, you know, obviously reflected a lot of depression in their writing. Um, so, and apparently- but Most didn't write about it. Thomas didn't write Wolf about did. it per se, but yeah. it's reflected yeah. in the tone and the subject, you know, how the, those books are constructed. So um, I'm kind of wondering if that isn't gonna be another piece of this flu that replicates or mirrors the earlier flu that that there's going to be this wave of people suffering from this long-term impact that is physical and has significant mental health um, implications, and then of course the isolation associated with it contributes to that as well. But um, but I think there is a, a brain, you know, the it, the virus obviously penetrates the a blood brain barrier and is affecting people's cognitive. Yeah. The, um, um, no, I, I lost it. <laughs> oh, Anybody I, else? I was going to say, um, I read a book in my book club called uh, The Last Town on Earth by Thomas Mullen, and it's about a small town in Washington state. And uh, I thought what was interesting in this book was they said in Iceland, they had a roadblock and no one was allowed beyond this roadblock. And that's what this Washington state town did, um, trying to limit the uh, town from visitors so that the disease wouldn't get passed on. And during COVID, several people mentioned that we should have roadblocks at um, the highway before coming in and tell people 
all people to turn around. And I thought that would have been a really good way to um, keep the town healthy, but you know, we would need delivery services like food and all of that kind of thing. So it really, really kind of posed kind of a, almost an impossible uh, situation. Mail, uh, all, all those services that we would need delivered here. Um, it's not like the early 1900s where, you know, we're canning everything and we can live off our gardens uh, for seasons on end. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting because it kind of went, that book was really good if anybody's interested in reading it. I saw your chat note. I've yeah. read it and I, I would recommend it. Um, it shows very well how people are human. You know, you can set out a certain bunch of rules and there are always going to be variables and people are going to act like people despite the rules. But I, will, but I will say that as late as May, when we were trying to decide when we were going to come over, the perception for us was, you're not welcome, don't come. I'm like, I don't want to be driving around with my Washington license plates. And I don't want to be making anybody uncomfortable. And I certainly don't, of course, want to be spreading anything. But Oh my gosh, this, as the summer progressed, I mean, the crowds, if you've written about it, Rich, the crowds of people were astonishing. I mean, we were like, are all our beloved small businesses going to survive? Rich, you've talked about this in your blog a couple of times. It, it's been a very busy, Oh yeah. mountains have been full. So that, yeah. that changed yeah. somehow, some at some time yeah it was uh, you're right there was a brief period where there was people there were people saying you know don't come don't come and then when businesses were closing down and people started getting the worries and we didn't have any immediate hard impact here then people all of a sudden let's open up and so it just switched completely i want to um i wanted to the, the thing i forgot earlier <laughs> mid-sentence uh, to go back to the writers um, uh, in this book America's Forgotten Pandemic um, Alfred Crosby who uh, he wrote this in I think 1972 and Crosby was is probably the founder of environmental history and he wrote came up with the concept of the Columbian Exchange um, but at any rate he he points out that Faulkner didn't write about it, although Faulkner uh, was set to go to Canada to Canada uh, to join an RAF unit or something or a, a Canadian unit before we got into the war, and uh, because illness occurred at the training camp, he couldn't go. Fitzgerald got on a boat and was going to go write about the Great War, and his boat was turned around because there were so many people sick and dying on the boat and Fitzgerald didn't write about it. Thomas Wolfe did write about it, and you can't go home again because his brother died of it. And a tragic, tragic thing. But um, uh, the, you know, the, the telling of a, of a big story that a novelist is chasing, they chase it in war oftentimes. And what uh, the one thing that uh, Laura Spinney sa said that really stuck with me she said, um, there were a million private tragedies with the pandemic. A million, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an event that you all participated in together. You all got sick and died on your own or with your few friends. So, and I was thinking about, well, how does that relate to today? And I'm thinking, you know, the only, if a writer were gonna, or a screener were gonna do, anything about where would he go or she she'd have to go to new york city when it was so intense and she'd have to pitch it in the in the in the healthcare system within new york city i think but other than that it's just crept around like this you know well, one of the oops one of the other pieces i'm reflecting on is 
all that we don't know in the previous discussion about racism, systemic structural racism. Yeah. All that we're suddenly like, hello, I mean, how come we didn't know this? It wasn't taught. How come we didn't know this? How, how come we didn't have, whoever said it, a blueprint? Um, it, it, it's, that's astonishing to me. And, and as an educator, I'm just like, wow. Um, we so were one, one, of the things that, one of the things that Kendi says in his book in History of Racism, that, that beliefs always precede the facts. You make the facts fit uh -huh. your belief. Uh -huh. And the, the tale of American history is a, 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 a history of progress and heroism and, um, you know, and success. And these things like slavery and racism and pandemic diseases unless we kind of flat out and conquer the hell out of it, they're not a big, you know, this one just frittered away on the third wave, didn't it? There was no vaccine. There was no finality. It just flittered away. So it wasn't in the American narrative. Yeah, Nance. Except that it is the precursor of all the seasonal flus since. Oh, yeah. They can yeah. Trace it back, you know. Yeah. So uh, it they're, hasn't they're been individual a, stories. Totally. That's right. And so we have 10, 15, 20,000 deaths a year, probably in the US, um, on seasonal flu. It's not a huge, it's not a big enough number to, you know, raise all kinds of alarms. Yeah. And we do, of course, have vaccines that, that, Help the game, but and the, the other thing, Linda, with yours is that um, we um, oh, we don't have um, well, Nancy was talking about the vaccines, but we don't have um, oh, I lost it again, Linda. Go ahead. Uh, oh, I, I was just, I think it was you, Debbie, mentioned AIDS and. Yeah you know, that had so many social issues attached to it, but that was a viral pandemic. You asked if it was epidemic or pandemic, I don't know, but uh, we'll call it, a, it was I a virus, it is a virus, not it was, it is a virus. And there's, and there's no vaccine. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think the difference between epidemic and pandemic is geography. Epidemic is like Ebola in Congo or something, right? Uh, where it's fairly isolated. It may have an enormous impact on a particular population, but it doesn't get the worldwide spread. Mm. It can, right. but it doesn't. Yeah. Um, and pandemic is once it's gone internationally. Yeah. So age would be a pandemic by that definition. Uh, you're right. <laughs> yeah. It started. It starts out as an epidemic and then becomes a pandemic. As it, yeah, right. as it. Uh, well, you know, one Wuhan thing I, was an epidemic. The rest of it's been a uh, pandemic. Okay, Greg, go ahead. Uh, uh, one thing I was wondering just about the uh, the difference in communications between nineteen eighteen and twenty or eighteen, um, whatever the date was, and today. You know, where we where we get instant reports and instant. We know exactly how many people have died here, how and, and how it's spreading. And, and there was nothing. There was no telephones right at the time. It was so so a very different situation as far as the uh, the communications. And I wonder if that played a role in um, in how it in how it kind of unfolded as well. Um, you know, some people probably had no idea what was going on, and it came through their town or community. And uh, oh, I think you're right. Yes. And you know, those troop ships that go back and forth and they, you know, one of the fascinating stories that she, is just how they, how they trace down this thing. And that's kind of interesting is the fact that you have these medical people that are so dedicated and just work years on this. And uh, again, Linda, your story about, uh, uh, about why we didn't learn this, all of those facts were out there. They were all out there, just like all the facts on racism were, but yeah. we just, they didn't fit the narrative, you know? Yeah. yeah, don't confuse me with the facts. 
And then AIDS comes along. Most of the books, there are a lot of books and there are a lot of articles now about 1918, but they start, Crosby's was one of the first. And then with AIDS in the 80s, then it picks up. And then you get learned articles and then you get all this other stuff. And then it turns out these researchers have been fiddling around with this all the time. I think doesn't, doesn't uh, in Crosby's book, they, even in the updated version, they still are, uh, there's still quite an argument about the origin of it. But in Spinney's book, we're pretty sure it starts with ducks, right? Mm -hmm. And it goes, it goes from duck to soldier, from soldier in Kansas to Boston, on a ship to Europe, and then boom. And I think it started either in the U.S. or I think it might have been in someplace in France. Was that the other? Um, well, the other, there was a there was another theory that maybe China or France, I think. But I think now the evidence is pretty convincing that duck. It was Kansas. Yeah, that duck, duck in Kansas to. Uh, to uh, soldier, to ship, or to hospital in Massachusetts, to ship, and then overseas, and then back on the ships, back and forth, and off around the world. Yeah. Well, and that impact uh, from to the transmission from animals to humans is an interesting uh, piece. And they were saying that articles lately talking about you know climate change and just the the the, the 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 intermingling of humanity and 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 with other other species and consumption the pressure on that is triggering this so you know there may be covid 19s more and more as we as we move ahead here it's uh the stress yeah. and, and the intersection well, and it's that interface the interface right. with we've we've crept into the there's less and less room for the right right yeah, yeah i've been wondering about and I haven't read anything about it, but just the um, what we're <laughs> what we're dealing with on so many fronts. But I I was here in Seattle, and I know it was bad there as well. But the smoke from these fires, and again, Rich, you called it out. It's it's not forest. I mean, it's acrid, toxic, horrible plastics and uh, burning, and we're breathing it, and the particulates and just the the planet is suffering, but the impact on human health, not this recent incident specifically, but all of it that we don't understand and how it's changing our environmental milieu. Is that part of what's creating conditions for something like this? Certainly. You know, the other... The other really strong parallel is the fact that the Spanish flu arrives simultaneous with World War, the World War, right? And there's a couple of other things going on there too. But we have also all these other things. We have the fires, we have the election, we have, uh, um, what else do we have going on now? There are three or four other things, you know. Yeah, so it, racial unrest, chaos in the street. Well, and, yeah, the, the Black Lives Matter and uh, and uh, the climate crisis. So we have all these things, and they all get wrapped up, and they influence one another also. She does point that out, that the flu impacts other things, the war, and the war impacts the flu, you know. So right now, COVID-19 impacts uh, the fires and the fires impact, you know? I, I think too, wasn't World War I the introduction of really environmental warfare with gases and yeah. I mean, it was horrific, yeah. um, a new level that we hadn't seen before yeah. of annihilation of <laughs> other human beings. It's and true. and that doesn't, I don't know, I'm sounding like my apocalyptic self, but that doesn't just disappear somewhere. I mean, we've put that into our earth space. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, Nora, what are you thinking there? Uh, I, 
I think I read something in a news article this week or last week here that said that more Americans died uh, from the pandemic than from World War One. It wasn't it wasn't a huge leap over the deaths from World War One, but it was uh, it was more than that. And that I mean that was a surprise to me. And like all of you who are history majors. So much of our history is, is really not discussed, including Indian history. And, uh, and this was just one more thing. It's like, why, why, why do we have such gaps in our historical record and in our teaching in the schools? I don't know. It was just, uh, it, was, it, was, it was astonishing what she brought out in that book. The correction there is more the difference between the m number of soldiers killed by the by the flu and the number killed in war was small okay but the difference between there were 675,000 Americans killed by the flu and the population at the time of the United States was 103 million so that would be equivalent to what today 600 well you'd yeah. have to multiply that by three times a little over three times so that would be the equivalent of of um of 20 million deaths today mm -hmm. by the flu in the so, u.s in the u.s yeah am i right there or two million I'm two not million. Sure. I think it would be the equivalent million. of two million deaths right yeah even if it's two million i mean we have two hundred thousand today not and I was, I'm pretty sure I've read or heard that that 200,000 is more than soldiers lost in Vietnam, World War II, or World War I combined. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that was tonight's news as we passed the 200,000 mark. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're. Uh, where does it go next? I mean, what, what, I, I think, I also think that when this, you know, I saw more face masks with smoke than I did with just COVID, plain COVID. Anybody else notice that? Yeah. Okay. I don't get to town. So now we get, we do away, and there's almost a, when the smoke went away, I know I felt a, a, a little mini euphoria and went on a couple good bike rides and, took off my mask to walk the dog and um and and you know i wonder if uh, if there's going to be an interplay there where people say oh hell we don't have to worry I, mm. linda it'd be more interesting to see what happens in seattle because you you had pretty thick smoke right we had very thick smoke and it was permeating um you couldn't get away from it and uh, yeah, it was pretty bad. And do you think COVID got swallowed up in it a little bit? I think Seattle is so assaulted at this point that <laughs> it's it's hard to oh. know. I, I was I was downtown for these dental appointments and took the opportunity to walk around. It's a very sad 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 place right now mm. so it's hard to um it's hard for me to tease out what's what i walked today and everybody was masked including me and it's a beautiful there was a nice breeze and blue sky it was a beautiful day but nobody was taking their masks off okay. mm. yeah i have friends in san francisco that say it's just about apocalyptic yeah on the streets of san francisco it's just yeah. unbelievable yep it is unbelievable describe um, that a little more what's well we've got a terrifically horrendous issue with um people living on the streets and yeah. so it's filthy it's just filthy and it's it's heartbreaking um and it's shocking and it's everywhere and it's 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 garbage it's large encampments 
I mean, it's, it's people sleeping in doorways. It's businesses just hanging on. It's businesses closing. It's small businesses closing. It's downtown is still boarded up. And who's on the streets are, are seriously compromised individuals. And then there's the issue with public safety and the police and <laughs> the mayor. And it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it feels pretty apocalyptical. And, you know, it's, this is a beautiful, how recently thriving, successful city. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what is going to come back. Um, kids are doing their best with online schooling. Ours, we've got kindergarten, third and fourth graders and parents who are highly committed and it is really difficult. And there's a lot of kids who, a lot, a lot, a lot of kids who have no kind of support. So we've got a whole generation that's not getting schooled. Kids can't be outside. <laughs> it's, oh. it, I'm feeling pretty, I've been holding my own, but uh, this last week is just like, what's next? Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, Nancy, what did you hear that, about? Are there still protests going on in Seattle? Um, there are. They're small. Um, and th that whole, well, of course, now our attorney general calling us whatever. I, I, I'm <laughs> anarchist. And I guess we're an anarchist city. Um, and that, that whole, what he's referring to, that chop, that zone that was created, it's, it's, it's cleaned up, it's gone. And there aren't, I mean, oh. for a while it was, I-5 was being shut down by protests. I mean, it was impossible just to do life in the city. That's not <clears throat> the case most recently. So, it sounds like San Francisco is similar. Um, yeah. Young people are moving out. Yeah. I have a couple of examples of where, you know, they're, they're more affluent. Uh, young people are, you know, moving to, they're getting a place in Tahoe for the next six months or up in Sonoma or, um, you know, yep. leave, basically leaving the city, truly leave, walking away from leases. Um, yep. And then the, the homeless, they gave everybody tents, thinking that that would be a way to help keep the homeless people from being into close quarters and therefore spreading disease. But the result of it is giant encampments literally down um, residential streets in the city itself. Oh, yeah. um, that and the I amount know. of human feces on the street is just overwhelming. Uh, people, I have friends that are up at the top of, well, they're down the side of Telegraph Hill, actually a beautiful home. Um, and they've had to literally go out and ask people to get off their, you know, stop camping on their patio, which just sits there and it's good sized. And, um, you know, somebody comes and puts a tent up there and they have to say, no, this is private property. You really need to leave. Um, I don't know that they've been belligerent, but it's just, you know, life in the city isn't in any way um, <laughs> like it had been. And the question is, of course, to what degree will things come back? Um, probably long term, significantly, but short term, I think the major urban areas are going to have huge impact, both in corporate vacancy, but also um, a flight to the suburbs and rural. That's happening in Seattle. Facebook is going to Bellevue. Amazon is going to Bellevue. Amazon built massive office blocks totally transformed downtown and created lots of wealth it those are empty <laughs> and it's just stunning uh, yeah. it's going to be a big so, demographic shift well, so today um uh katie kurtz who grew up here mm -hmm. and is a massage therapist and has been in portland for 20 years as a massage therapist is a single mom and linda the she has an eight-year-old so she said i couldn't do this online school um 
So one of the reasons, there were other, but one of the reasons she came back here is because we have in-classroom school here. Yeah. Thank God. And so she could bring her daughter here. She can work and uh, uh, take art classes at the Josephi Center. Yeah. Um, yeah I... I, yesterday, I took the three-year-old, our two families are within, a, depending on the traffic, between 35 and 40 minutes of each other. So we've got also a three and a four-year-old. So I took the three-year-old across town to have a play date with a four-year-old. First time those two have had any social contact so that the, they could focus on the homeschool for the other kids. And it gave me an opportunity to see what they're dealing with. And I, <laughs> I, I knew it was hard. I had no idea. It is hard. It is, those kids, they don't, our kindergartner who was so excited about starting kindergarten, so ready, she is just like, <laughs> I do not want to do this. Yeah. <laughs> no. Awful. Hello, Nora. Yeah, I know a, a woman who has a series of circles with uh, uh, middle school girls. She's been meeting with them for a couple of years, you know, where they explore, you know, who they are as girls and uh, how they relate to the world. And so they've been meeting on Zoom. But last weekend, she met with all four of her groups in person. And she said that in some of the groups, that was in all the groups that was the first time any of these girls in the four groups had been together with other girls in six months and some of them were so overcome by this that all they did in the session was cry wow it's just sad. it's just so sad what's happening to kids and everybody but kids oh my god yeah debbie debbie you were in yeah um uh... Nancy brought up a side side issue um, connected with health, and that's sanitation. Even in the rural areas where there used to be porta potties, where the city uh, facilities used to be open, they're locked. Um, and so I kind of wonder about that as well. I had friends in Eugene reporting of you know, finding feces on on trails on a regular basis. Um, so that would be a, a side issue, health-wise, um, connected to it. Yeah. We had a major outbreak of hepatitis B in an encampment quite close to us. Hmm. And yeah, wow. it was. Are there, are there any books, speaking of book clubs, about homelessness? Because that, to me, seems a huge issue. Um, is just so everywhere. But I haven't read, I haven't, there's articles, but I haven't read, read books. But also, the homelessness is just going to get so much worse because people are going to start getting evicted from their homes. It's just going to get so bad in, especially in the urban areas. Mm. Well, and the van, the van living is a major thing in Seattle. Streets are lined with, and they don't, you can't drive them. They're just decrepit. Right. Horrible. But they're they're a step up from a tent, right? But the garbage just um, piles up, right? Yeah, it's heartbreaking, really. Yeah, very. The the transportation system you're talking about roads. I mean, uh, whether they bail the airline industry out or not, uh, air travel is not going to be the same. I mean, we we talk about returning to normal, but uh, and th those office spaces. I I have a a group of people from the class of '60, and we didn't get to have our reunion, so we meet one, once a week for 45 minutes, about six or eight of us, and um, we've been discussed in Southern California. Uh, my friend Jimmy Gator said, "Rich, you don't understand. Any of us who own a house here." Are millionaires right. our houses are you remember that dinky little house that so-and-so lived in and that my dad paid twelve thousand dollars for it just sold for a million too uh you know so the the discrepancy um and the 
you know, you've got the homeless and you've got the, I don't know. I think the housing thing is, is totally cockeyed. It's totally cockeyed. And who knows where that's going to end. Uh, but the realtors in Willow County are doing very well, thank you, right now. Yeah. yeah. The prices in Willow County are astonishing. But it's this, when you get back to the systemic structural racism, property wealth and inherited wealth is a huge issue. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's, your example is a good one. The, the another issue is infrastructure. I mean, Seattle's, <laughs> our huge West Seattle bridge is closed down because it's cracked. They're afraid it'll collapse. And we just had a big chunk of our pier at our brand new waterfront park break off. Um, oh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really <laughs> unbelievable. Um, <laughs> I don't know how our mayor gets up in the morning. Well, and the oh, but you, I mean, but everybody, I mean, Willow County has infrastructure issues too. But you know, we're like this sweet spot here. I, you almost feel guilty. I get up every morning. I go for a bike ride. I go for a walk. I, you know, the Josephi Center. We have, <laughs> Cheryl. We had three or four of us in there. We can stay distant. We get people in and we talk to them. But everybody wears a mask, and we don't have. We had, gosh, today we had about 15 people in at one time, but that's about, most of the time it's threes and fours, you know, couples coming in and they're coming from everywhere, mostly from Seattle and Portland and Bend and Eugene and Boise. And uh, yeah, but we're this, like this sweet spot. And I'm sure that people look around here and the main street of Joseph has got these license plates from North Dakota and Maine and Christ. Uh, and so people are finding us and finding places like ours all across the country, I'm sure. Um, yeah. And, and what, what that, I think from this point, it's hard to say what the, what the population shifts, how they're going to go. But I, I would think that, that some areas, I, 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 ours just, we have to go up and some of the inner cities have to go down. And then the scary part is if the inner cities go down, that hurts again, the people, Linda, that you're talking about that are lowest on the ladders. Yes, Debbie. It's, uh, I just got back from Coos Bay area and uh, realized there's another population and um, that would be families that take to the RVs. They can attend school from anywhere, and the coast was more crowded than I've ever seen it. Mm -hmm. yeah. With young families, uh, well, instead I've, of seniors, people people of all ages, families, twenties, um, thirties, middle aged on up, but with their children, some with of them. With your children, yeah. Well, yeah, if you had the money and you had an RV and you could say, I can work from home, you know, yeah. at my financial office or whatever the hell. And since the kids are going to have to be schooled online, why don't we take them out to Joseph and show them a little where the Nez Perce were? And why don't we go over and look at the craters of the moon and teach a little geology in Idaho? Yeah. Renting RVs. One I've, of our families is thinking about doing that. A big road trip. Yeah. Just be self-contained. Yeah. I'd, I'd say that uh, from crabbing on the Winchester crabbing dock, it was a great place to get a cross, cross section of people and politics and every, yeah, the fires, everything else that was going on. All you had to do was throw your pots in, get your chair out and listen. So it's, it was pretty eye-opening, some of it. Wow. Um, one of the things I wanted to um, bring up, because in the book, you know, obviously they never had a vaccine for the Spanish flu. And, you know, there's this huge political rush to get a vaccine. Although today it sounds like the man on the TV is saying there's no more COVID, you know, um, so it does seem that the most healthy thing to do is to wear a mask, 
Um, you might be wearing a mask for a very long time. And I'm just kind of surprised that even if they've rushed to get a vaccine, how come they never got a vaccine for just the regular flu? I mean, I know they have the, you know, the flu shot and everything, but that's really, I mean, I think you can still get the flu even though you get the flu shot. I'm, well, that's but, because the regular flu mutates rapidly. Right. And they, right. Okay. Yeah. But you're right. And out of all the pandemic diseases, there are only, what is it, 18 or 20 that they have vaccines for? Yeah, so okay. it just, it's very surprising that they could say that there could be something, by, even by next spring. I mean, yeah. um, if that's the case, there's so many people that are anti-vaccine. I think yeah. there's going to be a lot of distrust about it actually working, just like the flu shot, like what you're saying. And so I'm wondering, you know, we're, we're just in such a, I'm sorry, my dog just, I don't know what it is, but I'm on this computer and she is just like going nuts, like wanting me to pet her and scratching at me. <laughs> anyway, she's right here, just like waiting for me to, um, anyway, so I just thought I'd throw that idea out there. I know that it's not really covered in the book because they didn't really talk about it, but I think it's a subject that's worth talking about now and how are they going to, are they gonna give this to every person or is it just to people with health insurance? And, you know, anyway, well, listen, we, that. we don't have a vaccine for AIDS yet, okay? So, yeah, there are a lot of advances, scientific advances, and the chances of getting a, a, a vaccine are decent. So, but then you get the vaccine, and as you said, you have to convince a certain number of people to take it, okay? And you have to have, in order to get that herd thing up, you have to get up to, I've heard everything from 50 to 75 or 80 percent uh, of the people have to be immune either from having it or from uh, from the, the vaccine. But there's no guarantee that we get a vaccine or that the vaccine is effective or that the vaccine doesn't have side effects. I mean, right. especially when you're hurrying it and when you've right. got 20% of the people that are uh, that are fearful, you got, I don't know, what, what percentage of people are as, actually anti-vaxxers? Is it, it's pretty, it's growing, 15, right? It's like 15%. 15%. Is it that high? It's fairly significant. There are 35% who say they probably will not get a vaccine when it comes out. And a, you know, a bunch of them are people who are fearful of long-term side effects that there won't have been enough long-term testing to right. really understand that. Um, but then the balance are anti-vax. And I thought I heard it was in the 15 to 20. I think it's 15-ish range. But here's the big question on vaccines, and that's durability. And, um, you know, it can be efficacious, you know, it works. Uh, it can have low side effects. That'd be great. But the question is, how long is it going to last? Really? And we won't know that until, you know, it, people who received it will have gone a year and not gotten COVID. And then will have gone two years and not. And so, um, and that is a giant question. And that's one that cannot be answered with the trials underway. Yeah. Right. I'm, so I'm, one of the things that is hopeful is that the Spanish flu did mutate really fast. And that is why we have seasonal flu today, because these are mutations of the old um, 1918 flu. And it's really different every year. And they try to guess, particularly by the infections they have in South America, what our season will be like. And that's what they create the vaccine or the shots against. But the, so far, the COVID that I'm aware of has only had one major um, mutation. And um, it went from what Wuhan had, which actually was a little more deadly, um, but a little less infectious than what we have now, which is a little more infectious, but not quite as deadly. Um, but so far, even with the big outbreaks, there, ha as far as I'm aware, 
there haven't been any other very significant mutations. If I, if I were in charge, I would um, be putting the emphasis on quick self-testing rather than the vaccine. Me too. So that we could each have our own kit and do our swab and then act accordingly. Yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think the vaccine and, and I think awesome. that Amazon is doing that with their employees. They are getting yep. tested almost with a, a kit that they've made for their employees. Um, yeah. My daughter has a roommate that did that testing for a while um, so that Amazon employees could continue to work through COVID and get tested. So I think some universities are using something like that. may not be there, but the, there is a test, and I'm sure there are false positives, but um, that yeah. could have put, been put into play, and we could have had mass production of it, but it, it just, somebody was sleeping at the, at the wheel. Yeah. Right. That's why I say if I were in charge, because it's, it's, it's available. We could do it, but... And I, and I just think, you know, yeah, the people in charge at the top and this hope around a vaccine, there's so many variables. That you know, there's, more one. <laughs> there's another thing with uh, Greg and I are the only males in this outfit. And one of the things is the, the uh, disruption of families and the impact, especially on women. Uh, because most, from what I read and hear, most of the online education, it falls to the women. Uh, and if somebody has to sacrifice a job, it's more often the, the woman in a family. And uh, so there's this, this somehow this, 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 COVID, just like I thought one of the fun things about the 1918, not fun, but the fact that in New York City, the Italian Americans were hit particularly hard. And the reasons they were hit particularly hard is because they lived next to each other and they were always in each other's laps and big Sunday gatherings and they were right. all together and they spread it around. Right. And uh, uh, so, you know, the, the, other impacts on this are are going to be, um, uh, and this thing shines a light on, uh, help shine, well, just like on the racism, the impact. I just got a, I've been corresponding with a guy who came through here on one of the, um, on one of the elder hostel deals, and uh, he teaches at a university in Hawaii. And uh, he said that Hawaii is devastated. Hawaii is devastated because they live on tourism. And I forget how many tourists he said, it was a figure like we had 2 million tourists last year and 22,000 this year in wow. whatever town but he was Hawaii, in. Hawaii has gone into very strict quarantine and you do not leave the airport without committing to a two week quarantine. And you do not, I mean, it's, it's strict. Yeah. And their numbers are actually pretty low, but they're not playing around. <laughs> but economically, they're devastated, Linda. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're because their, their, their uh, economy is based on tourism, you know. Yep. And, uh, yep. and he said also the Polynesian, the Pacific Island immigrants are, the again, the, the hit the hardest. Well, and Hawaii has huge issues, particularly Oahu, with homelessness, but not only Oahu, not only Honolulu. Yeah. So anyway, it is a it, this bright light on thing. Yeah, Greg. Uh, I, I don't think I was going to say anything. I just, um, I, I guess this whole thing is just, it, it's a wake up call and, and we need to heed it. And uh, you know, what are, what are we going to change? How are we going to change our ways? And how are we going to to learn from these these things? I mean, the economic impact, like you're talking about Hawaii. It's like, well, maybe we shouldn't all be flying to Hawaii for tourism. I know the the indigenous people aren't all that thrilled about it. <laughs> so I don't know. It's complicated and uh, 
you know, Linda, your comments about Seattle, it's, it's horrible. Our daughter lives up there and it just sounds, sounds awful. Um, yeah. So how do we, how do we adjust as a society and, and take action really to make some changes? I mean, the homeless issue to me, is just like, it's unbelievable that we just step over people in the street and right. just go on about our lives and off, right. off I go to Amazon, my job in the cubicle or wherever. And, there's 12 people I have to step over. It's just astonishing. It's just agreed. Yeah. Well, folks, it's, it's eight 15. So we've gone a little over an hour. We and... cheered ourselves up though, Rich. We're all on top of the world now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I want to thank it. No, it's thank you all. I, I certainly learned some things tonight. It's been a, a, a yeah. good discussion, I think. And, hey, Rich. Um, one of the books, this book, Evicted, that would be a really good book for this book club. Um, and I'm also thinking of another book called um, Cast. I don't know if anybody's oh, heard of I've that book. That. that would be another really good one. But um, you might want to talk about what the next book club, book group uh, book will be. Well, we kind of, yeah, we we kind of already decided that we're going to do Pearl Marsh's book, um, but not Jim Crow, which is not a literary masterpiece, but an interesting history of Willow County about the black community at Maxville and what happened to the people there. Um, and Pearl, I hope will join us at the end of October and we'll meet on that. Um, you know, we, if anybody has comments on more comments on this book and the whole pandemic thing, uh, I've been doing this little minute on the pandemic deal, but I'm happy to uh, to pass on some of your comments. So if somebody wants to write up a little, uh, you know, a couple hundred words about what's happening in your city or your town, um, I'll put it out to my little list of people that get my one minute on the pandemic. For me, it's a way of kind of keeping a diary. Uh, you You forget you know we're already forgetting the smoke of last week right right and right. so this helps me kind of keep my own diary and i i'd appreciate it if anybody uh, uh wants to share something all and feels comfortable with it i'll pass it on okay okay I, um so. to rich the sharing i thank you greg for putting evicted up that one's a few years old i don't um Okay. But just, you know, there's so much reading to do, and we can't all read all the same books all the time, but sharing resources is really appreciated. Right. So, so even, a, even a book synopsis sometime, right, Linda? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Blinkist. <laughs> what's that? Blinkist does these, what, 15 page summaries of books. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And CAST so, is actually, um, my, uh, my study group did CAST and there are great podcasts um, and also a New York Times synopsis or a condensed version of CAST, mm -hmm. which really um, got us into the substance of that. So, that's a suggestion on that book as well. Okay. And the fire next time, you're not gonna do that one? Um, I, I don't know. I, I would like to come back to the racial things. Uh, by the way, and uh, Cheryl encouraged me and I walked, I watched uh, I Am Not Your Negro. I Am Not Your Negro last <laughs> night. Oh, highly recommend it, highly recommend it. Yeah, it's a uh, one to watch us several times. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's uh, and it was three ninety nine on on uh, YouTube or something. It's uh, on Netflix. Netflix has it. Netflix has it. So anyway, well, another one uh, just completely off topic here. But if you're interested in the impact of social media on our society, oh my God, the uh, the, the the documentary, um, uh, the social dilemma. It's on yeah. Netflix. Oh my God. I think that's a must watch. 
that should be required watching for high school students, right? <laughs> well, all of us really, but yeah, it is sobering. And especially pre-election, I think we all need to watch that. <laughs> right, because it explains why there's these vast divisions. I, I would scratch my head going, how can this be so divided? It's like, oh, <laughs> now I get it. It's yeah. really important. It's really well done. Yeah. Well, we can trade, we can again, continue we can't we can't do 10 books a month or whatever in this way but we can keep trading information and i just like to offer up that i'm willing to be a pass through for some stuff too if people want to do that thanks and for doing book, this rich and 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 book and movie ideas are are great you know i'm happy to we'll i'll gather up some of that and pass it around Okay, folks, I'm gonna eat my dessert. Wait, let Nancy say she's got her hand up. Yeah, Nancy. Or is she I just am really enjoying this, and I had a couple of thoughts. One is maybe we should talk a little bit, not tonight necessarily, but we could do it online, about timing, because seven o'clock, especially in the winter time, is getting late for me, but okay. that's me, and I will be here even at seven o'clock. Uh, but the other is, um, I, I think more people would enjoy this. And so I would kind of encourage that each of us try to find at least one person to influence mm -hmm. to join us next time. Okay, Thank good. You. Yeah, I agree with you. And um, Nancy, before you came on, we talked about doing a survey to find out what the right time would be to capture, okay. you know, more, a bigger audience. Although I do like this small of an audience because it's giving us each a chance to talk. So I do like that too, but um, we're open to anything, right, Rich? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank, you yep. for, Thanks, you guys. thank you for just letting me listen. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, thanks. So thanks. Rich, uh, would you repeat the name of the next book? It's. Um, uh not it's pearl marsh is the author and it's not jim crow or something okay. it's got jim crow in the title we have copies it's also i think available on amazon pearl marsh m-a-r-s-h for those of you who don't know her brother amos was the only professional football player to ever come out of Wallow county and she went to her first six years of school in Wallowa and gave a, one of the best presentations we've ever had at the Josephi Center on growing up black in Wallowa. Yeah. And she went on to get a PhD in political science from Berkeley and yeah, pretty oh. amazing woman. Pretty okay, amazing. thank you. I'll send, out, I'll send out the title again. I think I put it in the last email, but I'll send it out again, okay? Okay, thanks. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.